Morning. Our opening hymn is number 470. You are no longer strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. The Vanity. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee 
and kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Psalm 133. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A Song of Creation. Glorify the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, you angels and all powers of the Lord. O heavens and all waters above the heavens, sun and moon and stars of the sky, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord. Every shower of rain and fall of dew, all winds and fire and heat, winter and summer, glorify the Lord, praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O chill and cold, drops of dew and flakes of snow, frost and cold, ice and sleet, glorify the Lord, praise him and highly exalt him forever. The Lord, O nights and days, O oh, shining light and enfolding dark, storm clouds and thunderbolts glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Let us glorify the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. So reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt 
and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. My child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. And to guide our feet into the way of peace, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Romans. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they now have been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are the blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? 
Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. From out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know I have shared previously a bit of this story, but I'm going to share it again because it is one that helps illuminate part of what this gospel makes us struggle with. Now, you all know that I grew up originally uh, in the Catholic Church, and I came to it late. You know, I was five by the time I started during Sunday school, and I always felt behind, as though there was stuff I didn't know that I should know that everyone else seemed to know already. And I remember being taught very clearly that Jesus was fully human. And this thought delighted me. It delighted me to believe that God could fully be one of us. Now, being the type of church that I was at, it was also fairly well emphasized that human beings were imperfect. We were imperfect. We were preparing for our first confession and first communion. Our inherent sinfulness was part of what we were being taught, the reason why we needed God. So, as I learned that Jesus, Son of God, fully divine, was also fully human, at the age of six or seven, I remember distinctly believing that Jesus must have sinned, that to be fully human, he had to be imperfect. And this, for me, was a source of great comfort, because as much as I was being taught about my own imperfection, it gave me comfort that Jesus, if God could so love Jesus in his imperfection, then perhaps I could be so loved. Now, as an adult looking back on this, I can see all sorts of problems of what was being taught to my six, seven-year-old self. And I remember distinctly feeling crushed to learn that Jesus was actually perfect that he could exist as a human being and be perfect. And then that was what we were meant to attain and strive for. I remember wondering, how could Jesus be fully human and yet not stumble and fall? To me, it seemed to be part of the nature of what it is to be human, to make mistakes. At seven, it was probably not telling the truth or stealing something from my sister, but nonetheless, imperfection was part of the game. So was Jesus truly fully human if he was not experiencing that? The perfection of Christ began being drilled to me in Sunday school. And I always felt a bit more distant when I saw the chasm between who Christ was and who I was. Then you encounter a gospel like today, after being taught for years and years that Jesus, Son of God, is perfect. And I have to wonder how true that statement is. You see, 
Jesus does not seem that perfect in our gospel today. It's a difficult text. It's meant to be difficult, and we should stumble through it together. The story of the Canaanite woman is always one that the preacher wrestles with and that we should wrestle with, because Jesus doesn't feel very Christ-like in this story. A woman comes to him begging for help. He doesn't even turn her away at first. He's just silent. He doesn't even give her a response. Does that sound like the Jesus we know and preach and love? The Jesus of compassion that we are so used to experiencing? It does take a bit of unpacking. The Canaanite woman is a loaded title to give her. In the Gospel of Matthew, it is perhaps a more positive title to give her, but she's an outsider. She's a Gentile. Now, the Canaanites can be traced back through Jesus' own lineage. So in this particular gospel, how the story appears is perhaps trying to tie her relationally to Jesus, ancestrally. That's part of Matthew's big thing. He goes through the whole lineage and genealogy of Jesus at the beginning of this gospel. When the woman approaches Jesus, she says, Lord, son of David. She points to that genealogy. She builds that connection in what she says. She knows that she is an outsider, and she is trying to tap into that relationship and connection to have with him. She uses the phrase, have mercy on me, invoking all she has heard about who Christ is, that he is merciful and compassionate. And yet he responds with anything but compassion, says, but he did not answer her at all. Can you imagine Jesus in the face of a desperate mother begging for mercy, standing there silently? What is this moment for Jesus? Was he just having a bad day? <laughs> How do we explain away such coldness? We have his response later on. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We see a narrowness in the ministry of Christ that we're not used to experiencing. We see a narrowness of his definition of who he has come for. And it's troubling because it does not fit with the theology that we are used to preaching. It does not fit with our understanding of the world, of our understanding of our faith and of Christ. It's hard to do anything but say, Jesus stumbled. In this text. Jesus was not the perfect son of God. And yet we have to remember that the Gospels, as much as they say about Christ, say a whole lot more about us. They are, yes, divinely inspired words of God, but the human hand wrote them down. The human hand is what compiled our scriptures and put together these stories. I wonder if within this text, as much as it talks about God's olden stumbling, it's also talking about our own. The evolution of the Christian faith, the narrowness with which we sometimes want to define it, and the evolution towards expansiveness that has come through the ages. Jesus has a turn. She, the Canaanite woman, does not stop. She persists. She is told that she should be sent away by the disciples. She is related to a dog by Jesus. He says it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She is ignored and then insulted. She is treated as less than. And yet, with the desperation of a mother, she does not give up. She said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Her tenacity, her resilience, built presumably from the love of her own child, keep her coming back to the son of God, begging for mercy. 
she has more faith in him in that moment than I think I would. She comes to him believing in the stories of mercy and forgiveness. She comes to him believing in all she has heard and the miracles that he can perform. We're in this little chunk of miracle stories in our lectionary. And she believes, even though he doesn't give her much reason to persist. And notice what it is that changes Christ. Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. He finally responds. His mercy and compassion comes not from within himself, but within her faith of him. It is her advocacy, her agency, that comes to change Christ's mind. There's really no other way to see it. Christ changes his mind. This is what it is for God to be in relationship with humanity, for God to be in relationship with the Christian story. It is constantly a story that changes and evolves as we know better, as we do better, as we reflect on how we have narrowly defined our faith in the past and how we are called to expansively define it in the future. The story of the Canaanite woman shows that the Christian faith is a living, breathing thing, that it will not look the same from century to century, as in these moments it did not look the same from one moment to the next. A narrow definition of who Christ was sent to be with is suddenly expanded to the Gentiles and to those he did not believe he was ministering to. So too must we approach our own faith, our own church, our own understanding of our calling that is a living, breathing thing, and that as we live within this world and live within one another, with one another, how we come to know God and our calling of God is ever-changing. I believe it's part of the beauty of what it means to be Christian. It is part of the beauty of what it is that God created humanity and gave us agency within this world. That the unexpected can take place. That as we grow and change, our knowledge of God will grow and change, and perhaps God's knowledge of us will grow and change as well. It is why we can never get too stuck in the way we've always done it. Because even for Jesus, that didn't hold true. Because he changed his mind because a woman persisted. She had faith. She had faith in a moment when perhaps she didn't need to. Or when she was not given a Christ who warranted having faith in. It is her actions that save her daughter that expand the Christian faith. How will we, in the face of our knowledge of Christ, in the face of all that is happening in the world, come to live into our faith in new and unexpected ways? Ways that seemed beyond the boundaries of our faith before. There is a phrase we constantly come back to in work such as the sacred ground class or um, social justice work in general. I hear many of our classmates in those classes say it, once you know better, you do better. We do not have to be defined and limited by who we have been in the past or by what we didn't know. But as we learn and grow with which all of us have the capacity for, we will do better. I don't know if this is an example of Christ sinning, but it certainly is not an example of Christ's perfection. It is an example, however, of his humanity. For once he knew better, he did better. And that is the greatest example of how we are called to be Christ-like, to learn and grow as he did, constantly striving to be the followers of Christ that God calls us to be 
in new and expansive ways. Amen. We continue with the Apostles' Creed on page 10. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue on page 11. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. 
Almighty God, you have given your only son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our son, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, O Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Lord. prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially those celebrating birthdays, Michael Spencer, John Guilford, and Nancy McReynolds, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those affected by the explosion in Beirut, those suffering from and affected by COVID-19, those on the Emmanuel prayer list, Diana Glenn, Niall Clark, Glenn Crosby, Florian Crosby, Roger Fitzpatrick, Diane Goodman, Lorna Hamill, Anna Hooper, Rosemary Howell, Kathy Klein, Peter Mackenheimer, Michael Miller, Claire Parkinson, Pam Rhodes, Aaron Rowley, Ron Smith, Vicki Smith, John Snow, Lillian Snow, William Victory, Bob Hayward, Michael Wandell, Julie Wiegand, and Peter Wiley. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Sue Rawlings, and those who mourn, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please add your prayers to the chat. Lord, we pray for Lynn Rada, for improved health and her daughters, Cabrina and Paula, for strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for parents, students, teachers, and all those who are navigating difficult decisions they will have to make in the fall. And we pray for their continued safety and health and wisdom in all the decisions they have to make. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, for all the prayers that we have said out loud and for all the prayers we keep in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue on page 13. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and the age of to come, life everlasting. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 139, lines 1, 2, and 3.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.